This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. All right, our favorite time of the week. That little block of time, those 30 minutes that we get to spend with you. If you're new to the show, welcome. I am Ray, he is Kenny, and this here, the most exciting 25 <laughs> seconds in television. Are you ready, Mr. Kenny? Ready. On your mark, get set, go. And we're off. Coming up, the new U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. What is it? How does it work? And who's the biggest benefactor? A little hint, there's more than one. Also on the program, not surprising, 2020 proved extremely difficult for peanut growers. However, it had nothing to do with the pandemic or any virus, just Mother Nature herself. And then later, Ray with a special feature on what USDA calls the world's oldest farmers club in continuous operation, the U Harley Farmers Club of Bartow County. That and so much more starts right now on the Farm Monitor. With an ever-growing demand for more transparency from both manufacturers and consumers, the U.S. Cotton Council has launched an unprecedented program in order to keep up with the times. Damon Jones tells you about the new Cotton Trust Protocol and its importance for the future of the cotton industry. Between the light, breathable shirt that keeps you comfortable throughout the day to the soft bed sheets that tuck you in at night, cotton truly is the fabric of our lives. And to ensure the public that it's being grown in a safe, sustainable fashion, the industry has created the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. As the consumers uh, of, of cotton uh, become more uh, focused on where the crop was produced and, and the production practice that went into it, it's important that, that we as, as growers are able to tell our story on how we are sustainable to make sure that cotton is still the, still the fabric of choice when it comes to, uh, when it comes to your, um, uh, your clothing selection. This program, which has been in the works since 2016, is unique in that it provides quantifiable goals for sustainability in the future. And the good news for growers is that it gives valuable information on their farming practices with very little extra work involved. There was a pilot program last year. This is the first year of it, it being live. Um, so the trust protocol is, is, is basically a mechanism for, for cotton growers to, to document their production practices and, and, and show you know, the things we're doing on the farm that, that are sustainable. So it's things we're already doing on the farm now, be it through a farm management software or even just writing it down in your date book. So all, all, you all you really have to do is go through through the Trust Protocol website and, and enter that information in. And between the Trust Protocol website and the, and the field print calculator that's tied to it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to let you know how your production practices stack up sustainability-wise compared to other growers here in Georgia and growers across the nation. And this data will be verified through a third party, which is essential for the future of the industry and world markets, as numerous major manufacturing companies like Nike and Levi's have pledged to use only 100% sustainable cotton by the year 2025. This gives the brands and retailers something to fall back on that it's not just the industry saying we're sustainable, we're actually going to have the verification of it that, that what we as cotton producers are doing are producing a sustainable product. You know, we as a country typically grow between 15 and 18 million bales of cotton, uh, but we only, we, uh, the domestic textile industry only consumes roughly about 3 million bales of cotton. So we, we, we're producing a product that, that's used worldwide, and we got to make sure that, that U.S. cotton isn't left off of any list of what is considered a sustainable product. We want to be the, the cotton the world trust, and we want to we be the preferred, uh, preferred choice of cotton for, for, the, for the world. And more than that, this protocol encapsulates the agricultural industry's stance on environmentalism and the farmers' desire to leave the land in better condition than they found it. You know, at the end of the day, as, as farmers, we, we care about our employees, we care about the land, we care about the environment, and we're going to do everything we can to continue producing uh, the highest quality fiber in, in the most sustainable way. Reporting from Dooley County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Meantime, in the latest USDA report, U.S. cotton production for the 2020 crop year was reduced by 1 million bales to 17.1 million. That's close to 3 million bales lower than last year. While all cotton producing regions saw reductions, Georgia, along with Texas, have the largest state level reductions. Dr. Jody Campisci, the National Cotton Council's Vice President of Economics and Policy Analysis, takes a closer look at the balance sheet. 
Looking at the U.S. balance sheet, there's a lot of uncertainty on the demand side given the unknowns regarding COVID-19. USDA is projecting a recovery in U.S. mill use to 2.5 million bales for the 2020 crop year. A decline is estimated for U.S. exports, dropping to 14.6 million due to lower U.S. supply and increased foreign competition. With lower production, ending stocks are projected to decline only slightly to 7.2 million bales. Current sales commitments for the 2020 crop year stand at 7.6 million bells due to a large carryover from the previous crop year. At this very early point in the 2020 marketing year, shipments have only reached 1.6 million bells as of September 3rd. China had the largest carryover from the previous crop year and has been the best buyer in recent weeks, resulting in current commitments of 2.7 million bells. Given all the different trade issues with China, those commitments are of particular interest given the Phase 1 agreement to increase purchases of U.S. cotton in 2020 and 2021. Demand is recovering, but there's still weakness as compared to pre-COVID levels. The 2020 peanut harvest is officially underway here in Georgia, but it certainly hasn't been an easy journey getting to this point. Yeah, the Monitor's John Holcomb visited with a grower in Turner County and explains how this year's season has been and how the harvest is going. For a peanut grower, the digging of their peanuts every year is a sign that the season is almost over, a sign that payday is near. Two things that many farmers are sure to be looking forward to after a very long and challenging year. Many farmers are already in their fields gathering this year's crop, and I recently visited two of them, Dylan and Dustin Ward down in Turner County. We grow around 250 acres of peanuts year in, year out, uh, just because that, that works out best for our rotation. We, we was tempted to plant a little more this year because the price looked better than anything else, but we decided just to stick with that 250 to keep from messing up rotation for next year. To keep with the theme of 2020, they've had a challenging year for their peanut crop. In fact, the difficulties with this year's crop started before they even got it in the ground and has continued all the way into harvest season. This year's been challenging uh, from the start and, and throughout it. It started out cold and wet. We didn't get planted as early as we'd like. Uh, then uh, turned off dry through the middle of the summer and here at the end now we're dealing with, with too much moisture and not enough sunshine and cloudy weather that's making harvest difficult. Once they dig up the peanuts, they have to let them dry, which in a normal year only takes a couple of days. But this is not a normal year by any means, which has pushed that couple of days to over a week for some of their peanuts. Typically, after we plow up peanuts, we'd be behind them with a picker in three or four days. Uh, but with all the with the hurricane and, and the cloudy weather we've had since the hurricane, uh, these are the first ones we've picked, and uh, they're nine days behind the plow, uh, and they're still they're tough, uh, and we're just having to work through it. If the peanuts are out in the field for too long after being dug up, it can hurt their crop, which ultimately hurts their bottom line. When they've been out here like this, uh, the vines get really tough. It's hard to get all the peanuts off the vine without shelling the peanuts, which uh, affects the price you get for them and uh, and then if you get behind and uh, they get too dry on you uh, you know you, you're losing weight and and also run into some more shelling issues and sadly picking them too early can be just as bad and can cause just as many issues well if you try to pick them out too early of uh, you know you just choke up the combine more than anything and and then when you got them to the buying point uh, if they were real high moisture, you know, it, it'd cost you a lot to have to get them dried down. Right now, they're just wanting to get the crop harvested and hopefully get a good weight per acre. I'd say a, a good dry land average would be two ton. Uh, we, we've been fortunate or spoiled, whatever you want to call it, the last few years. We, we've done better than that, but uh, this year we're just kind of hoping that we can get to that two ton mark. Reporting in Turner County for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. All right, after the break, we're taking you inside one of the most exclusive clubs on the entire planet. And it's located right here in Georgia, Bardo County to be exact. More on the U Harley Farmers Club after this. the Farmers to Families Food Box Program 
I saw one line that was hungry and one line that had so much food they had to dispose of it, the farmers. I said, let's put them together. Fresh produce, milk, dairy, delivered from our local family farms to those who are vulnerable across the country, saving countless jobs. I'm so proud of the people at USDA for designing this program in a very short period of time, a record period of time. With this program, it's really been able to save our business, and we're also feeding people that are out of work. six days worth of meals in each box and then we're distributing it out to everybody here. This is for my family. These are products anybody would be happy to take home to their family and feed their family with. So this is truly a win-win-win program. We're fulfilling our motto at USDA which is to do right and feed everyone. Well, few organizations have stood the test of time like the U Harley Farmers Club in Bardo County. We're talking two world wars, the Great Depression, and yes, even the pandemic of 2020. Its origin dates back to 1883 and its membership very exclusive. So much so that in order to even be considered for membership, a farmer must meet certain criteria and be invited to join. I myself received a personal invite not to join the group, but to sit in on one of their monthly meetings and document my experience. K farms on a Friday afternoon. As Dustin K walks the field with a friend, Father Darrell is preparing for his special guests. You see, one of the obligations of being in the U Harley Farmers Club is that every so often you host the monthly meeting. Today, it was Darrell's turn in the rotation, something he was happy to do. In fact, Darrell still remembers the moment he got the call telling him he was in. He was real good. Like a member, he'll recommend it to the club and then the club will discuss it and then they'll come back and they'll ask me, did I want to be in it? And I said, yes. I accepted it and I was very thrilled to, very thrilled to. Yep. Always kind of wanted to be in it. <laughs> and so one by one, they began to arrive. Some traveling from as far away as the other side of the county. Jim Raines, owner of Possum Trot Farms, traveled 45 minutes and said he would miss this day for anything. In addition to being a longtime member, Jim, you might say, is the club historian. And in this little black book, tells the story of generations past. These clubs were started all over the United States. They were encouraged to be started, to form, where farmers could learn from one another how they were farming and take this information back to their own farms and try to increase their production, make a better, better crop, better quality animals, and improve their livelihoods. Tom Smith, Lee Neal, Ricky Woods, and David Holt. 12 full-time members and seven honorary members. That's it. That is the entire makeup of the U Harley Farmers Club, and that has never changed in the club's 137-year history. Neither have the standards. First, you must be a farmer and live in Bardo County. You must also be an innovative thinker. And if a member leaves, their replacement must be voted in by a two-thirds vote. Although Jim does admit it works in your favor to be a legacy. My father was a member and uh, we have s several that are members. And, uh, there's one member that goes back all the way to the beginning of the club. I don't know that they claim, 
claim kin, but they, they've been so far back they can't even trace the lineage. Sure, over the years there have been many imitators, but few will ever come even remotely close to achieving the longevity of the Harley Farmers Club. Back in the mid-90s, the Georgia Senate declared the group, quote, the oldest meeting organization in continuous existence in the United States. USDA, meantime, calls them the oldest farmers club in continuous operation in the world. We have a gun safe that's full of minutes from the beginning, and we, we keep these under wraps. Anybody challenges us. We were challenged a few years ago. Uh, wasn't even close. It's hard to believe. It's really, really hard to believe that we're lucky enough to be one of the one of the twelve. It gives you a lot of pride for us to be the one that is still standing. is just phenomenal, and and we say we're not going to be the one that turns out the light. But we we're determined to keep this club going. Uh, it's a it's a real desire. We we're not going to lose lower our standards or anything. But we're go, we're going to keep keep this club going. I can see down the road that there are going to be people that raise vegetables. It's going to be a member of the U.R. Farmers Club. Uh, they're going to be beekeepers or they're going to be be something a little different from cotton farmers and corn farmers. If we can want to hold on to the past that way, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's realistic. I think the, you, you got to look at things realistic. Great time, thank you gentlemen for the invite. And don't forget folks, if you missed any part of the story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel, The Farm Monitor. Plenty of stuff to choose from. In fact, this archive, it goes all the way back to 2009. And while you're there, keep clicking and like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page. Send us some feedback as well. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, send us a message either on Facebook or the address that is on your TV screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Still to come, it's not the most comfortable thing to talk about, but the many ways in which it benefits soil health cannot be overlooked. That's next when the Farm Monitor continues. My goal uh, working with the dairy industry is to help producers achieve their dreams. That's Steve Bodart, a senior business consultant with Compere Financial. He and fellow team members worked with more than 90 Midwest farms to analyze what drives dairy profitability, which included nearly 490 years of farm records. And what we've tried to do is tie financial and production measures together to look at how that impacts the overall business. And are there any key items that the dairyman can consistently look at doing to improve the financial success of their business? From their analysis of financial and production data, several key factors rose to the surface, including energy corrected milk, somatic cell count, survival rates, and net herd replacement costs. Bodart explains that high milk production and high components is number one. When I look at that, you know, the goal that I think farmers need to be looking at is how do I produce more than 6 to 6.2 pounds of combined butter, fat, and protein per cow per day? What things do I need to get in play in order for that to be achieved? Bodart says that the top third of their clients reported a somatic cell count around 130,000. A low cell count has proven strongly correlated to profitability, and so has net herd replacement costs. We're looking at the difference between what it costs us to basically raise that heifer and what we receive for that animal when she leaves the herd. There was a difference of about a dollar ten a hundredweight in that net herd replacement cost, and that difference uh, turns out to end up in the profitability scheme of things 
being about $375 a cow difference per year in bottom line profitability. Since more mature cows produce more milk, Bodart advises producers keep 35% of the herd in the third lactation or greater. The quality of herd genetics can play a role in all these areas. And Bodart says the Holstein breed has answered the call for genetic improvement in recent years. Seeing what these Holstein herds are getting uh, for components in their milk, seeing the reproductive performance improve, seeing the longevity that we're getting out of these, some, some of these herds has just been great. In order to continue to thrive and survive going forward, we need to do better than the average producer. For Holstein Association USA, I'm Miles Ramsey. Well, finally this week, livestock and cover crops, two key principles of soil health. And while livestock might consume a lot of forage, most of the nutrients they take in are passed right back out onto the field. In a video produced by the Soil Health Institute, Burton Heatwall of Jenkins County discusses the impact that the grazing of cover crops had on his soil. Another one of the things that, that's really exciting to me is, is that kind of fifth leg of that stool in soil health. I and mean, we've, we've talked about live roots all the time. We've talked about biological diversity. We've talked about keeping the ground covered. We've got these aspects of it, but we also, livestock integration is huge. You know, cow eats X amount of, of grazing. How much of that comes out the back end? You know, what, what part of that does that cow actually capture that drives weight gain or milk production or whatever? Well, I would have probably told you 40 or 50% of what that cow eats stays with the cow. Well, that's not true. It's actually closer to 10%. So cows, I mean, you got your many, your, your many processors out there. You got all these four-footed soil organic matter <laughs> processors and you put those suckers out there and they eat and they take 10 percent of that crop and pitch the rest of it out the back and it's biologically active it's got fungi it's got it's got nitrogen it's got you know all that biology and for building soil rapidly you put cattle in that system yet so so that's what i'm that's my next exciting thing i'm kind of trying to work with is is putting cattle and grazing those summer covers in overwinter and uh, you know add more perimeter fence where we can take pivots and dump cows on it to harvest and 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 essentially transform a lot of that cover into pure organic matter and get paid for it you know with with added weight gain that's a really exciting thing to me I've been fighting the itch to put cows back on the farm for about four or five years now and it's I can't fight it much longer. It's it's one of those things that's gonna have to, that's gonna have to happen. I mean, because like you said, it's just it's. I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it's too appealing. Great job, Burton, and an even better job to all of you for deciding to spend time with us. And for that. We say thank you. Yeah, before we send you on your way, a friendly reminder to check out all our social media platforms, including our website at farm-monitor.com. You'll stay informed to see what's up in the world of agriculture and with us here on the Farm Monitor. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.